Hello, uh, welcome to my tutorial, more or less, of working on a straight razor optimized pretty much fully for uh, even mobile games, aside from the texture resolution, which is obscenely high just for uh, demonstration purposes. So um, I am a tech artist and I have worked in the VR industry for uh, a while now, but I am currently taking a break to work on my own projects. While I'm doing so, I figured might as well spread some of the uh, learnings I've, I've gained over the past couple years to those of you who would uh, find some value in them. So that's what I'm doing today. We're, we're, we're working on a model from start to finish, uh, all the way through the whole pipeline, the whole process. I'm doing this in one video right now, not because that is the most efficient way to learn, but because it's my first video on this topic and uh, probably need some feedback on how you would like these videos to be formatted in the future. <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to talk over this recording for this video and this recording is being played back in 1600 times speed. Um, 1600%, not 1600 times. That'd be really, really fast. It'd probably be like, probably be, probably, probably be done already, honestly. But, uh, yeah, no, 16, 16 times speed, pretty fast. This took hours, uh, probably around eight hours, which could have been faster, but I was focusing more on my process than I normally do because, uh, I, I had the, this, this mindset of, oh no, I'm recording this asset. So let's overthink things. All right. Um, first of all, I work in primarily a subdivision workflow and I don't use a whole lot of Booleans. And the reason I do that is because, um, I am used to working in super optimized meshes and super kind of like, uh, low, low triangle count meshes. Uh, for example, I've had to model ambulances, fire trucks, uh, sports cars, um, uh, dune buggies, all with 1800 tri budgets, which is ridiculous. Uh, as well as each of them had to share a, a UV sheet. So three vehicles sharing a single texture sheet, single 2k texture sheet. You have to get really optimized and really start to piece together this puzzle of how am I going to get these things to look good when I have almost zero budget? And that's that's a VR industry. That's why that's why VR games look the way they do. Uh, you have no but they, those things have like minuscule amounts of processors. Like take your phone, take your phone, and uh, put two 4K screens being rendered simultaneously out 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 of your phone. That's that's basically what we got to work with. So. VR, uh, not, not super fun to work in, in that, in that extent, but there is some fun puzzles to solve. So yeah, uh, that, that's what's happening here. You, you see me model in the background. <laughs> we'll do a breakdown where I, I probably model in, in real time, uh, and talk about like some of the decisions, but right now in this, in this model, there was, there was a lot of struggling with topology and edge flow. Uh, right now I'm working on the high poly, right? So we, we have a, a subdivision three, uh, which is what my high poly is going to end up being. And so I work in subdivision three most of the time uh, just to see like, oh, what's my end result? Now, subdivision three is my high poly, but subdivision one is going to be the base of my low poly. The reason I do this is because my high poly to me is the most important thing. And so that's where I get the silhouette. That's where I get the form of this object. And that's where I'm um, designing this object from. Uh, subdivision one usually maintains the silhouette of that high poly pretty well. Subdivision zero usually does not. Subdivision zero is just whatever topology I need for subdivision three to look correct. So subdivision zero, I don't end up using very often. I'll export out subdivision one, which is why I'll try to keep my topology as low poly as possible when I'm working. So that subdivision one isn't too much work to clean up. That's usually my thought process for this. Uh, so you'll see that at where I export out after I spend way too long getting this curvature correct. 
again, uh, when, when you're working on curvature and you're working on your topology, if it's not working, let it go. Try a different approach. If you need to remodel the whole thing from scratch, do do it. Just just let it go and remodel the whole thing from scratch. Don't get stuck on stuff. Uh, learning and modeling, you when you have the right answer, you'll know, and it'll take you three seconds to to do the thing you're trying to do. And modeling, a lot of times, like being skilled at modeling is just already knowing how to model, which is like kind of um, paradoxical. If you don't know how to model, modeling is hard. If you know how to model, modeling is easy. But the only way you know how to modeling is how to model is by knowing how to model. <laughs> the, it, it's, uh, yeah, so you just have to get the right answer to have the right answer. It's, uh, that sounds really, really dumb, but that's, that's pretty much what it is. So with, with this model, I struggled a lot with figuring out what the right answer was. Took some of those answers the next day to a different model and modeled it instantly because I already had the answers. So, hey, it's just how it is. Over time, the more you model, the more you're going to have the right answers right away. Um, but yeah, going to, back to my subdivision three, uh, that, that's my focus right now. I don't really care about topology too much. I want the subdivision three to look clean. The surface needs to look clean. I'm using a reflective material so I could see how the light is going to glint off of that surface in a way that, uh, gives me the exact result I'm looking for. So I'm not worried about topology yet. I'm, I'm keeping it in mind because my subdivision one is going to be based off of this topology. So I don't want it to be so messy that it takes me hours to clean it up. But again, like even here, this could be a Boolean operation where you just trim that top edge. I'm not doing that because I don't want to mess with my topology too much. I'd rather tweak it manually, which could be tedious and, and, it, and it looks kind of newbie sometimes, but uh, it ends up being less work for me in the long run. So no Booleans, uh, just move things around manually, keep my topology exactly how I want it, have maintain control of that topology the whole time. Uh, so yeah, looks clean. Uh, it, we're at the point where I'm like pretty happy with it. Uh, but at this point I start adding materials. The reason I do this is like one, it's look development. It helps me make decisions about the model. Here you can see I added material and I don't like how that curve uh, looks anymore. I'm, I'm realizing there's kind of like a weird uh, discontinuation of my curve, but and the materials. So for look development and second as an ID mask, so I can use those materials in the high poly as a mask for materials and substance painter later. Uh, I, I, as I said, I don't need this model to look one to one to the original model. The idea with this model is that if I wanted to, I could make it one to one, but it's not important to me that it is one to one. I mod always model for the use case of the model. In this case, the use case is this video. So there is a limit to how far I'm willing to take the asset uh, in terms of uh, doing it one-to-one -one with the original. I also don't want to use the original um, designs, logos, and exact layout 100% uh, because it's less fun. I like making up my own logos. I like making up my own designs. So yeah, you can see I add materials to this right away. It's a, you don't have to do that. Uh, I, I sometimes work that way. I sometimes don't. It's kind of random. Um, I work in mirror as much as possible. So here I'm, I'm mirroring the assets. Uh, just get a feel for how it's going to look. Uh, how everything works together. You know, you build it with the, the mechanism of if this thing was real. I'm adding this little like little gap for the blade to fit in between the wood right now, uh, which I believe is in the straight razor. I don't actually have one. As you see, I don't like clean shave very often, so <laughs> don't have a straight razor. So I'm just going off of my reference images. Uh, this topology, I don't know. I, I struggled with this topology for like way too long. And then once I figured it out, I this was another instance where like next time I modeled it, got it instantly. Um, I wasn't. I would have just added two edge loops underneath and two edge. We'll, we'll break it down and when I model in real time later and, and you'll see like an a, a approach to it that's way faster. But in the end, it doesn't matter how I got there because it, it looks right in the high poly. And honestly, a lot of times if it looks right, it might actually be right. Uh, with the exception of how long did it take you to get there? Because when you're working on production art, the amount of time it takes you to do something is important, but the reality is, is this isn't production art. 
So the fact that it looks right means it is right, given the circumstance, even though that's kind of like frustrating to think about and it's not always satisfying. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we're going to come back to making the low poly now. And you can see I, I have subdivision one, which I applied. I made a duplicate of the mesh and I applied it. And oh boy, there uh, is a lot of edge loops here. It's way more than I was intending. Um, which isn't a problem for the sake of the model. The model is going to turn out fine. But it's a problem in how time consuming it's going to be for me to do this. Um, because my budget for this this project is 800 triangles, which is which is pretty high. That like for this type of asset, 800 triangles uh, assumes that this is a maybe a hero asset. Um, it's either a hero asset or it's going to be like used in a cutscene or it's going to be picked up by the player. You're actually going to look at this thing close up. And I could have added maybe an extra 50 triangles to get rid of almost 100% of the faceting. Uh, I left a little bit of faceting to show... Faceting is like, by the way, where, they, where the edges connect, where you can see polygons. Uh, where you can see like, oh, it's chunky here. It's it's not smooth. That's, that's what we call faceted. Um, so I left a little bit of faceting just to show that like, even with a little faceting, an asset could look nice. It's not that big of a deal, but in general, uh, I think a lot of YouTubers talk about low poly, but they send this really bizarre idea of low poly because low poly, like an, an optimized asset is the only edge loops you have on the, the asset itself are the ones absolutely necessary for maintaining the silhouette of the asset. They're absolutely necessary for maintaining important plane changes, important curvature. And like what a lot of people consider to be important curvature is not important curvature. Um, so really low poly assets are like you are removing everything absolutely not necessary. Like every single vert. I did not take this asset that far because I couldn't be bothered with, with what this, this project is. But you want to get rid of literally every single vert that's not necessary. We're merging every vert that doesn't maintain curvature. We're... Um, deleting them where we're, we're combining everything down you can see like all of these edges they don't matter we can smash them off to the side uh we don't even like have poles like if you had a a, a disc we have all the triangles to a center vert pole you pull that off to the side so you you don't have the cost of that extra vert that that's literally how optimized we get so this guy ended up being 590 triangles for the whole for the whole model for the whole low poly which is uh, lower than I was anticipating, which is pretty good. Like I said, could have could have gone a little bit higher. Um, doesn't really matter for the sake of the render. I think it looks fine. You always throw a little depth of field on the render to 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 cover up your your polygon sins. So, but yeah, uh, depends on the use case. Every model you make, model it for what it's going to be used for. If you're making models for a mobile game. You're going to model for the mobile game. If you're going to make models for a AAA game, you're going to model for the AAA game. If you're modeling for Unreal Engine, you're modeling a different way than if you're modeling for Unity, probably. Um, all of your models are dependent on what they're going to be used for. There's no such thing as a model that just works for everything. So, uh, in this case, this model, I modeled it as if it was going to be used in a VR game uh, because that is what I just was doing so but that being said like a vr game is a hero asset you can see the topology with the, the, the triangles edge loop it, it caused some distortion of the mesh a little bit too heavy um especially because i uv unwrap in a way that's like okay my uvs i care less about stretching than having ugly seams i don't want seams in my uvs personal preference is i don't like seams so I'd rather have a little stretching than seams, but this amount of stretching is, is unacceptable, uh, especially because this asset is going to have a logo on it. So I, I retopologize it here to reduce the amount of distortion I was getting, and I did fix it, um, which it didn't take too long to do. Uh, and I'm laying it out on half a sheet um, because I plan on mirroring this <laughs> asset, which ends up uh, biting me in the ass later. But anyway, uh, it, it's, it's half a sheet. Uh, we're going to mirror the blade. We're going to mirror the handle. Um, typically, in a game, you're going to... Like, multiple assets are going to be on one UV sheet, depending. 
It, everything is depends. So my thought process is, eh, I'm going to work under the pretense that this is going to share a UV sheet. So I'm not going to worry about it just only being half a UV sheet. Or you could do like a two by one UV, which I've never personally, you'd use it on trim sheets a lot. I've never really used it on a prop, but you, you probably could do that. Um, baking here was weird because I accidentally put a capital H in the name of the handle. So I baked to the mesh name, which means that the handle is only going to bake to the handle with the same name. And I accidentally capitalized the H. And so I couldn't figure out why it wasn't bake, baking properly. And so I realized I, I typoed it. Um, and so, yeah, so we're, we're getting texturing, texturing for me. You can see, I used that ID map of where the gold material was, um, so that I don't have to go paint it in manually. So on your high poly mesh, you can add separate meshes. It doesn't have to be airtight. You can add a bunch of little bits just to make sure that your materials are all, you could, you could subdivide it. You can add edge loops, uh, purposely just to do material, uh, masks. And that speeds up the process when it when you come to texturing quite a bit. So that's what I did here. My texturing process is a layered based uh, mentality where I'll start with like base color, um, and then I'll add a layer for like my macro color and then micro color variations. I'll do like base roughness, uh, roughness variation, macro, uh, micro roughness variation, and then height and so on and so forth. And I work in that with that mindset. You could do that with less layers and just actually making a version of all of those layers, but that's kind of the mindset. And then you get to like curvature, macro curvature, micro curvature, details, uh, AO, etc. cetera. Um, as well as like a lot of times you would, uh, I would work on um, my appeal. Oh, so... So in general, my thought process is that like, sorry, I got a message. Uh, things don't need to be fully realistic. I have my text, my, my reference open on this side of my screen. I'm looking at it constantly and I'm constantly looking to my reference when I'm making any and all decisions, but those decisions to me, like the, the being accurate to the reference is way less important than the appeal of the object itself. So how does that apply to things? That's kind of a subjective idea, but it, it applies in that, like, let's say making the material realistic means that I'm not going to bake in any lighting data because it's a, it's a physically based material. So it wouldn't have lighting data baked into the texture. It wouldn't have highlighted edges or it wouldn't have you know, uh, a, a, a dark, silky, cooler AO, ambient occlusion sort of vibe to it. But I'm going to bake in subtle versions of that to my material itself to the point where you won't notice it necessarily when you're looking at it, but it, it's more appealing. It feels more tangible. It has more substance to it. There's more depth and uh, dynamism to the object itself. And so whenever I'm working... I'm baking those things in for the uh, gold itself. Gold plating is not going to have that much color variation on it. It's not a paint or a, a, you know, like a dip where the edges will be thinner because the, the paint is stretching out over the edges and the surfaces where it kind of uh, the surface tension brings the paint together is thicker. You, you're not going to have that with, with plating most of the time. But I'm still going to add some of those elements in because I think they add interest and they add a history to the object. Um, that's the other thing. History, another really important idea. What is the state of this object? Where has it been? Who's using it? How old is it? What's the history? The history, the story, the narrative of the object and baking that into the materials as I go. Uh, in this case, this thing's like new, out of the box, doesn't even have finger grease on it yet has a little bit of oxidation because everything does, but like, you know, the handle's not finger greased up yet. It doesn't have like a smooth wear on it yet. The blade doesn't have face grease on it. Doesn't have little hair bits. Uh, so moving on to the wood here, I would have done this wood in Substance Designer. This wood was way better suited for Substance Designer. 
Uh, in general, I'd love to use Substance Designer anytime I can, but uh, doing a project in Substance Designer seemed out of scope for this exercise. And um, uh, so I, it's also helpful to show like how far you could take things in Substance Painter alone, because you can build materials similarly to how you would build them in Substance Designer without having to go into Substance Designer. There are clearly limitations, and it's sometimes a lot more work, but you can do it. Uh, wood is also just, in general, really hard to do, because um, we, in games, uh, there, there's a thing called clear coat, which, which you can use to have a second specular highlight on an object. And in real life, you will oftentimes have like multiple levels of specularity, where you have the roughness of, of an object and then maybe it has an enamel coating which has its own specularity but you're also hitting the the surface details underneath the enamel and then you have grease layer which can even have another layer of specularity so things start to stack up wood especially glossy wood shiny wood has a lot of that subtle weird specular um stuff happening and doing that in cg on one layer is is really hard uh and and also wood is porous it has a lot of holes in it it has a lot of um gaps in the grain and and all of that and trying to do that in a shiny material that is flat often ends up looking like plastic or or enamel or some kind of resin and so i i think at the end this wood specifically um looked a little plasticky <laughs> i actually asked my my uh girlfriend like what what she thought and she's an artist as well so um she kind of she <laughs> she broke it down pretty pretty good here and uh we i went and i gave it a second try of like okay well it's not reading correctly it doesn't feel like wood it's a little plasticky like what something can what's something that i can do to quickly add that element of wood in and uh yeah this this didn't pass the exam but uh it ended up being making it more porous um i think had i gone back and fixed this again i would do more with the grease and oil layer but for this i added i made this like ice cream cone alpha shape where i had this little dot and then a smeared version of it and i put the dot at the end of the smear and then I blurred it and then I took like a a histogram select to to select like what the was the equivalent of like a, a like an ice cream cone and I blurred that and then I used that as a height mask to kind of make it look porous and so that's what what you're seeing here and I feel like it was it was relatively successful <laughs> it, it worked pretty well oh my god apparently it is dinner time so uh we'll finish this up in a minute yeah uh let me just say it. I am, I am, I am, like, when, when the food's ready, you, you really don't have much time, so, I, I get it, I get the urgency, it's gonna get cold, but anyway, uh, yeah, so my super creative logo design here, uh, we have the substance razor, we have the really sharp blade, and we have the number three, uh, bikini bottom, I, uh, I clearly just lost all, ability to think while I was was coming up with this stuff but hell yeah it, it's representative of, <laughs> of the process you'd use that you can see I'm like I'm, I'm baking the logo into the wood to try and bring out more of that that wood look by using the how would a painted material interact with this actual wood not enamel and I think that helped sell it a little bit again I can do another video in real time breaking down my substance painter process uh, which uh, also those of you who see this video those of you who make this this far into this video I would uh, greatly appreciate feedback on how you like to learn um, this is my my first of video of this kind and I would love to make more and I would love some yeah feedback on on what kind of approach uh, you all would would like to see but yeah, so now I'm bringing the maps back. I've exported them out of Substance Painter. I'm bringing them back into Blender. And um, I screwed this up because I didn't triangulate my mesh uh, out of Blender before I brought it into Substance Painter. And so Substance Painter triangulated it automatically. 
And what that means is taking all my quads and adding that edge loop to make it triangles because rendering engines render in triangles. And so uh, what ended up happening is the triangles created a different normal map and it uh, did not align with the, the substance painter visuals didn't align with my blender visuals. So what I did is I triangulated the mesh. I gave it weighted normals, which I can explain in more depth in uh, future content. And I brought it back in the substance painter, I rebaked it and I re-exported it. Now this didn't fix the issue. Uh, also, by the way, I used OpenGL normals. You have to use OpenGL normal map when you're working with blender. So I had to add that as an export out of substance painter to work with. Uh, but that didn't fix it because, um, and I spent about an hour trying to figure out why my normals wouldn't work. I forgot to save settings when exporting out of Substance Painter, so I was exporting to the wrong file. So every time I'd make a change to my mesh and blender, bring that into Substance Painter, bake it, and export that back out, it would look different because I had changed it in blender, but it was the same texture map every time. I realized just now in the video that I was exporting to the wrong folder. So I figured this out and voila, it looks it looks perfect. I was like, yippee. Um, and then I go to mirror it and yeah, it turns out uh, the, um, yeah, the text doesn't mirror. Text, uh, if you mirror it, it's backwards. <laughs> so the text on the other side of the blade is backwards. I didn't care at this point. We're, we're, we're moving on to rendering. And um, rendering process, I get an HDRI to use as an ambient light. So I turn that thing down to like 0.1 intensity. It's like really low. Um, and then I get my environment set up using reference again, three point lighting for the generic uh, lighting effect. I got my top light. I got my front light. I got my rear light and then screw three point lighting again. Uh, it's great, but I care more about appeal. So oftentimes I'll use light linking to get a perfect um, rim light on an object or, you know, something like that. I'll, I'll color the lights pretty heavily. I didn't do any post-processing on this render because I felt like it wasn't in the spirit of this video. So you're, you're not going to see post-processing, but, um, yeah, I was experimenting, trying to get a specific specular hit on the blade. Um, and again, throwing out my three point lighting. It's the fundamental of my lighting, but I wanted more appeal out of little tiny details. Uh, so I used geometry nodes here to make a more interesting background as well. And that was just really quick geometry node setup, uh, just using a Voronoi texture on some uh, extrudes to to make an interesting looking background. Subdivide that. I As you can see here, I'm also using EV and cycles at the same time. EV so that I can see where my lights are and cycles so I can see the render and EV is a lot faster to work in. But uh, my computer was still <laughs> struggling uh, pretty, pretty heavily at this point using both rendering engines at the same time. Uh, but yeah, also, uh, in general, I, I work on an ultra wide monitor, but I recorded in, um, 1080p. So, uh, there's more screen off to the side, but I, I squished everything together for the sake of this video, but normally I don't work squished. All right. So last thing to do is to render it. And, uh, yeah, this is the final render. I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video and, uh, I will see you again in the future. All right. Peace out.